We want to start yeah. on the Bank of England, of course, and what they did today, and then broaden it out a bit. So specifically, when you look at the Bank of England, they did the 50 basis point rate hike. They kept the door open to more rate hikes. They see the economy probably in recession now, but some slowdown needed to slow down inflation. If you were there, how would you have voted? I'd have voted for a cup. Um, I think they've got it completely wrong. And I think it was very important today. For the first time, we have two dissenters, um, professors of economics, who actually study and understand inflation and wages. Um, and they, they, they didn't go along with it. I think the uh, evidence is the UK economy is slowing very rapidly. And it's hard to put together um, the idea that they're raising rates. When you go back and look at their forecast, Prior to all the fiscal stuff the government did, the Bank of England was forecasting an eight-quarter recession. And at the forecast horizon, which is what a central bank is supposed to look at, deflation with the high probability. So it's really hard to understand. Oh, and that was, as I said, before all the fiscal austerity we've just seen. So there's a complete incoherence. Clearly, the UK is in recession, just like in 2008. We've all missed it. And I disagree a little bit with the prior com commentator who was very sensible, I think that they're going to U-turn very fast. So explain to us, Danny, what is wrong with the... It's, it's kind of almost like doctrine now. If you look at Paul Volcker, he's the, the patron saint. You have to have a very severe... Uh, not necessarily contraction, but you have to slow things down. You have to get your uh, key rate above the inflation rate, or you will not do enough. And in the end, you'll have to do more to bring down inflation. What's wrong with that? Well, that might have been true in 1979, 1980, where... What we saw around the world after the Paris riots was a huge rise in unionization rates around the world. 25% or so in the private sector now were in small single digits. For, uh, work, unions had COLA clauses on their contracts, so that meant automatically that wages ticked up. That's what a wage spiral means. Today, there is no evidence whatsoever that workers have anything to do with this. There's no evidence that wages have actually been rising since the beginning of 2022 at all. What we've had are two supply shocks. Supply shock from COVID, once-off shocks, bang, followed by another once-off shock. And those base effects are dropping out. So if you ask, you're, people don't understand what a central bank is supposed to do. Central banker thinks, okay, what, is, what happens in 18 months to two years? So imagine today, Inflation's going along at one, and one month it jumps by 10. So now inflation's, you know, double digits. It's double digits for 12 months. And in 12 months' time, the 10 drops out. Mm. The central bank should not respond to that in any way. So what we're seeing is mistaken understanding of inflation, not understanding that actually the cure that they've imposed is much worse than the problem. I mean, obviously, financial markets may have a different right, view. Right. But they're going to have to reverse things because what you're going to see for the next six months, just watch this space. For the next six months, just as in the last month, inflation so, is going to drop like a stone and okay. it will be below 2% by July. And it will probably be in deflation territory okay. by September. So, Danny, help us understand then what's what we're not understanding because when you look at the headline data in the labor markets you see the supply and demand really has surprised to the upside but explain to us in some of your papers you mentioned non-employment and underemployment as being key in understanding wage push inflation well yes absolutely thank you for those questions i mean the, the story in a way if i was to ask look back what was the biggest mistake the fed made from 2010 to 2020 it was this as the unemployment rate fell, it said, oh, well, wages are going to take off. Well, they didn't. It turns out neither the vacancy rate, which the Fed has focused on, Waller and others have said, we should look at the vacancy rate. That tells us something. Well, it turns out that the vacancy rate and the unemployment rate tell us basically nothing about what's happened in the labor market. To put it technically, I'm a wage person. It turns out that the vacancy rate and the unemployment rate since the Great Recession have no effect on wages at all. None. They don't enter into wage equation. They used to, but they don't. So the question is, what's going on? And the answer is that the non-employment rate, the labor force participation rate, and underemployment do. And what you need to explain why wage growth for a decade was very low was you need a variable that tells you there's lots of slack. So turns out those are the variables that, that actually tell you this. So there's much more slack in the labor market than most people think. 
um, the potential for a wage explosion is basically nil because if you look at the, the, the non-employment rates, that's hugely below where it was in 2020, 2008, 2000. So I think it's a complete misunderstanding of what's happened in the labour market. Um, okay. and, the, and, the, and what we're seeing is that this is just bad thinking. Labour economists study wages, labour market slack, and the Fed's mm. clueless. Danny, what about the China variable? Bloomberg Economics is estimating if we see a full reopening, you could see a 20% boost to global energy prices. We could see it actually pushing US CPI back to close to 6% by the end of next year. Is that the wild card in, ter in terms of global inflationary pressure? Well, of course. I mean, there are wild cards. That's obviously you know, a wild card. It might be a once-off wild card. It might be my 10% again. Clearly, th there's an issue. Um, the wild cards are actually interesting. I mean, the wild cards we had two years ago was a pandemic that came and then a war in Ukraine that came. So supply shocks are obviously going to impact inflation. They're going to impact activity. But the question is, should a central bank respond to those once-off shocks? And the answer is no. Um, that, that Essentially because they're going to just disappear. The reality is for the next six months we're going to see base effects dropping out. Now, if another okay. shock comes, absolutely, but you respond to that shock as you should have responded to the other two, which right. is sit there and you say, what's going to happen in 18 months' time? And as I say, the Bank of England is forecasting All based right. on um, prior to this rate rise that in two years' time, inflation will be below the target. So if you look at their forecast, they, based on their forecast, should have been cutting rates. All right.